Hi everybody, um, it's Kelly. Um, welcome back to Completely Clementine. Uh, we read up to chapter four. So today I'm gonna do five, six, and seven. All right, so all you have to do is sit back and relax and listen to Completely Clementine. And let's see what happens. Hmm, what do you think's gonna happen to her in this, these chapters? All right, let's find out together, okay? Chapter five. When we got off the bus, Margaret led me up to her apartment to show me her new shoes. She took me right into her closet without even asking if I'd had to shower that day, the way she usually does, and slid a pink box off the top shelf. Wow, I said when she lifted the lid, are they real gold? Of course, probably, uh, maybe. Don't breathe so hard on them, Margaret said. You'll fog up the patina. Oh my gosh, this is her closet. Ooh. So I turned my head and I did side breathing. <sighs> While I admired Margaret's sparkly new shoes for a while. How tall are they? I asked when I thought we had done enough admiring. Oh, eight or nine inches, um, maybe even 10. I don't think so, Margaret, I said. Then I held one of the shoes against my left forearm and I measured it. The heel is two inches high, I told Margaret. How do you know that, she asked because it fits between Betula Galus and Alua Borealis, which are exactly two inches apart. I held the shoe up against my arm again to show her. Well, plus my fingernail, two inches and a fingernail. Are they hard to walk in? Hold on, hold on, Margaret said. Your name, you named your freckles? Um, actually my dad did, I said. He named them after stars. We played a game about the constellation on my arms. Orion's over here. Suddenly thinking about my dad made my eyes sting and my throat hurt. Never mind, I said. Those heels are two inches tall, Margaret, not ten. And a fingernail. And a fingernail, which is pretty high. All right, I admitted. I can't believe your mother let you get them. She didn't want to, Margaret said. She's afraid I'm going to fall and break my neck. That's how effective my silent treatment is. How's your silent treatment going? I'm still doing it, I said. I checked her watch. Three days, 21 hours, and 49 minutes. But it's so hard. In fact, I think it's the hardest thing I've ever done. Margaret's eyebrows shot up. Hmm? Really? It's harder than... Margaret looked at me, and I looked at her. I know we were both thinking about the same thing. The thing that was so bad, neither one of us wanted to say it out loud. Well, my kitten moisturizer went missing last winter. I don't know if it's harder than that, I said, after I thought about it for a while but it's definitely lonelier. It makes me miss my dad. It feels like he's in another country, far away, and I can't go there with him. Margaret's face crumpled a little at that, and I remembered Margaret's mother was going on a honeymoon with Alan after the wedding to Paris, France, which really is another country, far away. Are you gonna miss your mother next week, I asked. Margaret put her shoes back on the shelf and she went back into her room. I followed her. She nodded. It's the first time she's ever left. Do you wish you could go with them, I asked. Margaret made the horror face she always makes when her mother and Alan are kissing. Are you crazy? Do you know what a honeymoon is? I nodded yes, then I shook my head. No, tell me. Margaret shuddered and jumped back as if some newlyweds were about to burst in and start honeymooning right in front of her. You're lucky you don't know, she muttered. You should keep it that way. After she shuddered a few more times, she said, besides, I wanna stay here. My father's coming from California and Mitchell and I are going to spend the whole week in a fancy hotel with him while our mother and Alan are gone. Room service and cleaning ladies every day. Margaret reached down to give her cat a pat. Even mascara is coming. We're going there right after the wedding. There's a picture, she's petting mascara. Mascara scrambled under bed, so I don't think he was too interested in the idea of living in a hotel for a whole week, but I was. When I was little, I read a book about a girl named Eloise who lived in a hotel her whole life. Elevators and vending machines and spying on famous people for a whole week and sanitized toilets and fresh sterilized bathrobes and individual wrapped up bars of soap every day and cleaning ladies, Clementine. The best part is my father said that I can stay in the room 
when they're, while they're cleaning it. So I can pick up some professional tips. Oh my gosh, I know. You should come visit. I wasn't sure about that. I did want to go to an Eloise kind of hotel, of course. But sometimes being in a room that's too neat, it makes me feel itchy. So instead of deciding, I said, hey, Alan's ashtray is almost finished. Want to see it? To throw her off that idea. When Margaret learned that Alan was going to move in with him after the wedding, she went all historical. It wasn't the idea of Alan living there. It was his pipe. What would she do about that pipe? How would she know where the pipe germs were? Was the big worry for her. But then she had the good idea of giving him an ashtray for his pipe to live in. And the second good idea of having me make the ashtray. Margaret got me one of Alan's backup pipes so I could make it make sure the pipe would fit in it. My mom gave me a big slab of clay from her friend Astrid, who is a potter and makes things. And my dad helped me with the design. Margaret did want to see it, of course, because she knew it wasn't just gonna be any old ashtray. Um, gosh, she knew it was gonna look good. I'm only gonna look though, she said. I don't touch stuff like that. We rode the elevator down to the workshop and I swept the dish towel off the ashtray with the big, ta-da! Oh my gosh, there it is. Pretty creative. She made an ashtray. I said, here's the bedroom where the, where the pipe rests when Alan's not smoking it. Here's the dining room, and that's where Alan can fill it up, and over here, swimming pool. That's where you can make him wash it. So when are you going to bake it clean? Margaret asked. The wedding's on Saturday, you know. No matter how many times I told her that you fire pottery in a kiln to harden the clay, a kiln, she still insists that it's a germ destroying strategy. I've given up trying to get Margaret to understand art. I just can't get her to understand art. We fired the ashtray at my mom's friend's studio last weekend. That's why it's hard, I said. I explained tonight we're going to glaze it and then it gets fired in the kiln again, hotter this time. Don't worry, it'll be ready in time suddenly remembered something. When my father heard the date that Margaret's mother and Alan were getting married, he said it was an extremely lucky one. It was the same date he and my mom had gotten married, except 13 years later. So that meant Saturday was also my parents' anniversary. All the wedding stuff reminded me to ask Maria and Rashid's newest question. Joe said his dog Buddy could pull the carriage along the parade route, no problem, but Maria's worried about what he'll do when they release the 100 white doves. She's afraid he'll chase them. What do you think? Margaret shook her head as this was the most ridiculous thing she'd ever heard. The carriage ride is before the ceremony, she said. The doves are released after. But just to be sure, have them take Buddy to the park to practice not chasing the pigeons. I wrote this down on my arm, being careful not to cover any freckle stars. So I'd remember it tomorrow. Then I went back to my own apartment and started a new drawing. Let me tell you, it's not easy to make a clam look terrified. The problem is the shell. It's very hard to put any expression at all on someone whose face is in a seashell. But I did it. I took the drawing into my dad's room and propped it up on his pillow. Just before I left, I noticed the book he kept on his bedside table, the one I helped him start a while ago. It's called The Building Manager. And in it, we keep track of interesting things that happen in our building. I opened it up to see if he'd written anything new in it. He had. The building manager's daughter had stopped speaking to him, I read. This made the building manager terribly, terribly sad. <gasps> I quick flipped through the pages. Mostly the stories were fun to remember. I read about the time the ice cream truck blew a tire in front of our building and we bought all the ice cream from the driver and threw a big party on the rooftop before it all melted. I read about the night the power went out and everyone came down to the lobby with candles and we told ghost stories. Then I got to one that wasn't so good. The time I sold everybody's charity gives away to each other, giveaways to each other. The problem about that was the things my neighbors were giving away had been presents from other neighbors. Oh my gosh, when people found out the presents had been tossed, they were mad at each other for a long time. At the end of the chapter, I'd written in the book that the building manager's daughter prompts that she'd think ahead about doing things before she did them so she wouldn't get in trouble. I stared down at the promise. Since then, 
I usually had tried to hard to think ahead, but sometimes, okay, fine. Lots of times, I still didn't. I closed the book and I shoved it back on the table. As I did, some paper drawings found out. I picked them up, my sad animal drawings. My father was saving all of them. And there's the terrified clam picture. All right, chapter six. Like the fruit that is my name, Clementine, sometimes I feel divided into sections. Thursday morning, the last day of school, some of my Clementine sections were worrying about how hard it would be to say goodbye. I sure grew a lot and now I'm ready for challenges of the fourth grade to Mr. DeMatz. I had stayed awake late the night before, remembering my promise to think about things before I did them and remembering something else. Oh gosh, um, when my grandparents moved to Florida, everyone said goodbye except me. It had been too hard. But afterward, I felt even worse for not saying goodbye to them. I finally had to write a letter saying, goodbye, I'm sorry I didn't say goodbye. And then I couldn't stop crying. So now some of my sections were thinking ahead and worrying about how bad I might feel all summer if I didn't say goodbye to my teacher. I sat my, by myself at the back of the bus so my two parts could argue about it on the way to school. Finally, just when the bus pulled into the parking circle, I knew. I was going to let my teacher say goodbye to me and I was going to say it back. But when I got into our classroom for the last first time of a third grade day, I had a terrible surprise. Our substitute, Mrs. Nagel, was draping her jacket over the back of Mr. DeMatz's chair. How come you're here? Where's our teacher? He's absent today. Oh my gosh. All that worrying and her teacher wasn't there. Let's see what happens next. All day, I guessed. All day, I'm afraid. But he wouldn't do that. We didn't say goodbye. We didn't say goodbye and today's our last chance. I pressed my hands hard to my eyes to let them know I am N-O-T not going to cry about this. Mrs. Nagel scooted back in her chair so she could look at me better. I'm sorry, she said, and I could tell she really meant it as if maybe she had forgotten to say goodbye to somebody once and that I'd been too late. I know he been, didn't plan to be away today, she said. He had a last minute conflict. These things happen. She held out a tissue to me. As I reached for it, Mrs. Nagel looked down at the words over my wrist. Bring Buddy to park, no chasing pigeons. I could see her remembering that she had learned about arm reminders from me last time she was here. You're Clementine, right? She said with a little smile. Then she invited me to stay with her at the desk while the other kids were still coming in. You can help me get organized here, she said. There's Mrs. Nagel, the substitute. Substitutes are good. They really help out kids. They're just there to help. I stayed up at Mrs. Nagel's desk, even though she really didn't need any help or getting organized. And even though I was still pretty upset about my teacher being absent, because I had re I remembered something for her too. Last time she was here, she brought a picture of her new baby nephew. And although he was wrapped up in a blanket, I could tell he was half rat. <laughs> Since this is the kind of thing you usually only get to read about in a supermarket checkout line, I've been thinking about this kid a lot. How's your nephew, I asked politely. Is he squeaking yet? I is he speaking yet, she asked. No, he's still just a baby. How about cheese, I asked. Did you notice that he likes cheese a lot? And do you have any new pictures in there? I asked, one that maybe shows him running around. Mrs. Nagel looked at me as though she had no idea what I was talking about and began digging around in her bag. All she took out was a, was a, plan, a plan book and a pen. Where's your stuff, I asked. Where's your mug and your tissue and your stickers? You have a good memory, Mrs. Nagel said. I did bring all those things last time, but I packed lightly this time. I'm only here for, she looked at her watch. Six hours and 20 minutes, not long at all. Today will just be, she pulled out a note from her plan book and read it aloud from the neat handwriting I could tell it was from our teacher, reporting about our year, packing the last things up, saying our goodbyes and handing out our report cards. Right after the pledge, she got started on the reporting our year thing. Mr. DeMatz has asked each of you to share with the class the best thing you learned in third grade. Who would like to go first? 
Charlie raised his hand. Um, the best thing I learned this year was how to get a vending machine to give out extra candy bars. Mrs. Nagel's head shot up at that. Really? She said. Your teacher taught you that? Charlie looked confused. No, no, Baxter taught us that. Baxter had only been at our school for four days in September. But four days with Baxter was plenty, let me tell you. He was a one-kid gang of criminals. And when he left, we all figured he was going to go to prison. Willie went next. Um, Baxter taught me how to pick a lock with a hairpin, he said, without even leaving fingerprints. Do you want to see? We all did, of course, but Mrs. Nagel clapped her hands together. Children, she said, children. From now on, we're going to hear about school things. The best, the best lesson, the best project, or the best book, that kind of thing. Half the kids' head cl heads clunked down onto their desk. Ay. Who'd like to share one of those things, Mrs. Nagel asked. Nobody raised a hand. Never mind, she said with a sigh. Excuse me. Let's move on to the packing and say goodbye. We got out the boxes we'd brought in and started filling them up. I packed my cardboard sphinx, my welcome to the future rocket hat, and my Charlotte's Web barn diorama. With each thing that disappeared into the boxes, our classroom started looking lonelier. While we packed up, we visited each other and said goodbye, and I learned something. It wasn't saying goodbye I hated. It was not knowing if I'd see that person again. For instance, I couldn't say goodbye to our hamsters, Zippy and Bump, because they were going to go home with Mr. DeMatz, and I didn't know if they'd ever be back at school. Have a good summer, I told them. Hope that dud baby isn't too boring for you, but I didn't actually say goodbye. But to the rest of the kids, I did. And, and said it was fine. Goodbye, see you next year, I said to all the kids in my class. Well, all the kids except Olive, who likes you to talk Olive talk to her. Golovud, Balivet, Salava, Yola, no, I can't do it really well. Yolavu, Nolavu, Yalavir, I said to her, and that was fine too. But every time I said a goodbye, it reminded me of the one that I hadn't said, the hardest one. The one to Mr. DeMatz. She's saying goodbye to Olive there. So many goodbyes. At recess, I told Rashid and Maria the idea of making Buddy practice with the pigeons. That's good, Maria said, because if Buddy chomped a bunch of doves, it would probably run, ruin that fairy tale effect that Margaret's always talking about. Did you watch Danger Rangers last week, Clementine? Rashid asked. What? Yes. Now Margaret also had to remind you about the bells. The hundred doves are supposed to fly out of a bell place when they start ringing. She and Maria had to pick out a good bell song. Rashid was looking at me with melty eyes and a goofy smile. Make it a song like you, Clementine, he said, because now I love you. Maria and I both glared at him. Me, I said, you can't love me, you love Maria. I used to, Rashid agreed but Maria's mother doesn't allow television and you get to watch Danger Rangers. So now I love you. Rashid, being, isn't in, being in love isn't like breakfast cereal. It's not like one day you love oatmeal and the next day you change your mind and it's Frosty Pops and hold the bananas. Tell him, Maria. Uh-oh. What? He's in love with Clementine now? Let's see what happens. Oh my gosh. Maria was squinty eyeing me. Am I the oatmeal or the Frosty Pop, she asked. What? It's that thing you said. Am I the oatmeal or the fro Frosty Pops? I, I, well, you're the first thing I guess, the oatmeal. But the point is, he can't just stop loving you and boom, start loving. I don't want to be the oatmeal, she said. I'll be the Frosty Pops. You be the oatmeal. Um, I don't want to be the oatmeal. I'll be the Frosty Pops. You be the oatmeal. I don't want to be the oatmeal or the Frosty Pops, I yelled. I don't want to be any cereal at all. Well, I'm not going to be in love anymore if it means I'm just a glump of oatmeal. Maria raised her hand as to swivel, waved it. Remember, she said to me, above the shoulder, above the shoulder, below the crown. Then she skipped off. I turned to Rashid. You can't love me. I don't allow it. Too late, said Rashid. It's already happened. I know because I feel gozzled when I look at you. Gozzled. Gozzled isn't even a word. Yes, it is, he said. It's exactly the word for how I feel, for how you feel when you're in love. And I feel it when I look at you. All gozzled. 
Well, just feel gozzled by yourself, okay? Because I definitely don't feel gozzled back. After school, Margaret came to my apartment because her mother was working late at the bank and Mitchell had a, had a basketball game. Oh my gosh. There he is. Oh my gosh, Rashid's looking gozzled. At, Marie's, at, at Margaret's house apartment, we made a tall stack of toast and brought it to the kitchen table. Margaret waited until my mother sat down. Then she chose the opposite chair, the chair opposite of her. Ever since Margaret learned my mother was pregnant, she had, she's been keep, keeping a safe distance from her. As if she expects our baby is just a bomb waiting to explode all over her. I used to think she was being ridiculous, but I've seen my mother's belly up close now. So I'm kind of keeping my distance too. So my mom said, Clementine says you have big plans for the summer, Margaret. Margaret beamed. I've worked out a brand new cleaning schedule for my bedroom. Monday's reorganize my closet. Wednesday's wash and fold all my clothes. Friday's vacuum and polish. It's going to be a great summer, she said. Not that, Margaret, I, cry. I cried the good thing. Margaret looked confused. California, the commercial. Here they are at the table. Clementine, Margaret, and her mom. The commercial, oh, oh, right, she said. My dad's filming a commercial for a water park in August. I'm going to be in it. I can be either one of the lucky kids who gets to go there or one of the sad kids <laughs> who doesn't, whichever I want. But about the summer cleaning schedule, I forgot to say the best part. Every other Saturday, we're gonna steam clean my rug. Margaret's face melted into the magical dream of this extra clean summer. My mother and I raised our eyebrows at each other in secret. You must be kidding faces. Well, my mom said, I bet you're excited about the wedding. This crashed Margaret right out of her mar magical dream. She scowled and shot me the secret, you must be kidding me face. I explained to my mom about Margaret being an expert on royal weddings. If this country ever goes back to having a king and queen, I added, and they have prince and princesses who need to get ma married, Margaret's going to be the one they call. Maybe you'll grow, up, you'll grow up to be a wedding planner, my mother said to Margaret. That's someone who organizes everything about weddings. Margaret dropped her toast. She didn't even jump to get the dust buster. That's a job, she gasped, and people could pay for it because I, I'd pay people to let me do it. What about makeup artists, I reminded her. I thought that was gonna be your career. Margaret looked torn for a moment, but then she brightened. I know, I'll organize the wedding and I'll do the bride's makeup. I'll call it the full service treatment. Then she sank her head into her arms. Oh, and that's another thing, she groaned. My mother said the only makeup she's gonna wear on Saturday is some lipstick. And she wants to put that on by herself. I don't know why she's even bothering to get married. There's only one reason in the world to get married, and that's to have a great big wedding, something that's fancy. And this isn't going to be a real wedding at all. A real, a real wedding is whatever the two people getting married want it to be, my mom said. And your mother and Alan want it to be simple. I think simple weddings are the nicest. This time, I joined Margaret in the you must be kidding me face. Everyone knows that fancy is better than plain. My mom hoisted herself out of her chair. She sponged off the table and then she eyed the high chair in the corner. Mom, I said, it's clean. You wash it every day, plus you just painted it. It's covered with brand new, never been dirty paint. My mother ignored me and started running hot water into a bucket. Margaret tipped her head and watched my mother with a funny expression on her face, as if she'd, as if she'd never seen her before. I leaned over and, whis and whispered into Margaret's ear. She's gotten obsessed with cleaning and organizing stuff lately. It's called nesting. She'll be able to, she'll be back to normal after the baby's born. But for now, she's a little crazy. Margaret shot me a look that said she thought I was the crazy one here. She got up and stood right beside my mother. Never mind the exploding baby. Belly eyeing the high chair. How about we boil it, she, she suggested. That will clean it and kill all the germs. Oh, they're cleaning the high chair. My mother looked at Margaret as, as if this was an incredible, brilliant, genius idea. Then she sighed, I wish, she said, but I don't have a big enough pot. No problem, Margaret said. We'll take the tray off and then unscrew the arms and the legs. I got out of there, I got out of there quick in case whatever was wrong with them was catching. Oh my gosh. Okay, that was chapter five and six.
and tune back later and we will read more chapters of Completely Clementine. All right, have a great day. Talk to you soon. We'll find out what happens to Clementine and the baby and Margaret and Margaret